Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. I'm Casey. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I'd like to thank Janesta for inviting me. I'd like to thank everyone else for having me. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be anywhere where people will actually listen to what I say. So I got the floor. I got the microphone. I'm here for 50 minutes. Um, My sobriety date is September 15th, 2005. So that means I've got about 17 and a half years, and I'm, I fully understand and comprehend that I only have today. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm giving something back today. I'm an active participant in my own recovery, and I think that's why I've got 17 and a half years. So I want to tell you my story. <clears throat> I was born in 1962 in a small town in West Virginia. The town's called Mayberry. It's a very small town. I'm the, the, the youngest of five children in my family. Uh, growing up, there was nothing to do in my town. We had three channels on our TV. One of them was educational, so it didn't really count. So my backyard was a mountain, and uh, I would play on the mountain as a child. And I, I knew where all the springs were. I knew where the rabbit holes were. It was a great, great childhood. Up to the age of about four, when I first experienced sex, sexual abuse at the um, at the hands of an older, much older male relative. And at the age of four, it was a one-time thing. And um, it didn't really seem to shake my world. It happened one more time when I was seven. And that was the apocalypse. But it happened at the age of seven. It changed everything for me. So I think at the age of seven, I remember I was between the first and second grade here in the U.S. And I remember going into the second grade and I was a terribly dysfunctional second grader. I remember I had a secret inside of me and I was afraid that that secret was going to somehow pop out by mistake. So if you can imagine that. um, I didn't know how to act. I didn't know how to behave. My report card, I still got my report cards. My report card from that second grade had red X's on follows rules and regulations. Everything else was great, but follows rules and regulations was red X's all year long. So apparently I just was just discombobulated um, from that point forward. My drinking and drugging career actually started right about that same age. So let me let me cover that with you and then I'll go on. Um, my father was a business owner and he would come home at night and he would ask me as a seven-year-old, as a seven-year-old son, he would ask me to go into the kitchen and make him a drink and he would tell me how to do it. He said, you take four, two fingers of bourbon in the bottom of a glass, which I guess my little fingers because I was seven. He, he said, pour two fingers of bourbon into the bottom of a glass and fill the rest up with water. And so I had the formula, you know, I had the formula for how to mix a drink. So I remember going into the kitchen and, you know, getting into the liquor cabinet and pouring the drink. And sooner or later, I think it was sooner, I remember taking that two fingers of bourbon and just turning it up and drinking it. And so um, what I discovered at the age of seven is that there were substances that I could put into my body which would fix what was in some, fix what was wrong inside of me. So I found a solution. Uh, at the age of seven, I found that there was a solution <clears throat> to this problem. The only issue was the fake IDs don't work when you're seven. So I, I had to find some way of getting alcohol at the age of seven. Um, my parents were my supplier for a long time. And uh, I remember... I remember I, I thought I was a really smart kid and I would take liquor out of their out of their bottles and fill it back with water. And I thought I was ahead of the game on this one. I remember my mom came and showed it to me. She showed me their brown liquor, their bourbon. 
and she showed me it was not brown, but it was amber, where I had been pouring water into it. And so they, she caught me. I mean, they, they caught me. At, now, I never got away with anything as a child that my parents knew. They knew all along that I was drinking. Um, drugs also played a part in my story, and I, I'll try to keep it brief on the drugs, but there's some, some parts that you do have to have that to understand. Um, when I was about the same age, I had strep throat, and the pharmacy gave me the wrong pills. I remember there were supposed to be small blue pills, and they were big green pills. My mom used to have to cut them in half, and I remember the pharmacist saying there'd be small blue, and I remember taking these pills every four hours, and I remember hallucinating. I'm coming telling my mom that I had seen the Joker off a playing card. Now, here I'm seven years old, homesick with strep throat, taking medicine. It's not doing me any good for strep throat, but I was tripping. You know, I, was, I was seeing things, and I saw jets going over, and I was seven years old and had overdosed on some medicine that was completely wrong, you know, for me. So at the at an age of seven or eight, I just knew that there were just a, a magic box of, of substances out there in the universe that I had to find. And, and I was on a mission from that point forward. So um, back in the 70s, it was really popular for a short time to make your own beer and wine. And here in the U.S., there was some TV shows where, you know, people were making wine. Grizzly Adams had like a, a uh, some kind of a animal skin gourd. And those were popular in the 70s. And I actually talked to my parents into getting me the supplies to make beer and wine for them. So here I am, like I was 10 or 11, and I was making beer and wine for my parents. So you know how it turned out. I mean, it turned out like crap. Uh, I mean, there was bugs on it, and it was, it was just uh, yeast. It was really, but it had alcohol. What I discovered is my parents would not drink it, but I would. So at the age of 10, 10 or 11, I learned how to make my own beer and wine. Not, not very good, um, which also might explain what I do for a job. I've been a physics professor for 30 years, too. So I had, maybe I got my start making beer and wine for myself as a 10-year-old. So let me fast forward just a little bit. Um, so I was always a good student and it seemed like it just kind of went downhill in dribs and drabs and small pieces. Uh, there was always, I was always able to, to get it done. I was always able to be successful. Um, and I think ultimately being successful was the worst thing for me. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about this. I was able to graduate high school, fourth in my class, um, went up to college. And I did what a lot of us do in colleges. I went to one college, uh, kind of flunked out, went to another college, kind of flunked out, went to a third college. And I had in West Virginia, there was only about four or five colleges. And so I had to go back all the way to the first college and finish. So I, it took me six years to get a four year degree, but I understand that's average for us. So six years to get a four year bachelor's degree in physics, went on and got a master's degree in nuclear engineering. Took me, I did the same thing there, bounced around at a different couple different colleges and actually finished at the University of Virginia with a master's degree, didn't learn anything, incapable of learning. I was capable of passing the tests. I was capable of getting done what you told me to do. So, and I think that kind of goes hand in hand with that successful thing. It's like I was able to be successful, but never really the right way. So um, I was married at this point. I married my drinking buddy uh, straight out of high school. Um, graduated, got my first job, and I, I worked for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission in Chicago. And I was there. I was there for about a year. And, you know, my, that drinking straight from the, the bottom of a cup, drinking straight liquor that I did at seven, was the way I always drank. Uh, up to the age of 42, 
I mean, I always just drank. I was going to drink to get drunk, and there's that's just the best way to do it, the fastest way to do it, to drink liquor and you need to get drunk. So when I started work straight out of graduate school, um, you know, I was I was still drinking that straight liquor at night and going to work in the morning. And I think I was starting work at 630 in the morning. And I remember one, <clears throat> one morning my supervisor was just a little too close. He was standing in my sphere. He was just a little too close to me. And I, I remember that moment when I understood my supervisor had smelled me because I, I could just tell. I could he kind of took a step step closer. Then I could tell that he was deliberately smelling. I could just tell. And plus I smelled like it. I knew I smelled like it. So after about a year working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, I knew that what was coming was not going to be good because somebody knew. I knew somebody knew what I was doing. This was in the late 90s. There were no drug tests. They were just starting to do drug tests. <laughs> um, so before anything could be done to me, uh, I applied for a job. This will make you feel real comfortable. I applied for a job working in the control room of a commercial nuclear reactor here in South Carolina, in South Carolina. And uh, I got, got the job, got the job as a reactor engineer working in the control room. And if, you, if you've ever done anything in the nuclear industry, you, you can't drain and go into war because they have sniffers. You have to go through a sniffer. At least you, you used to have to in the early 90s. You go through and you stand in a machine and the machine would blow air past you and they, they would pick it right up. So I did what a lot of us would do is um, take sedatives. Um, I went to a doctor, got a prescription for sedatives. So when I would go to work at the power plant and take a couple of sedatives, and then when I got home, I would drink. And this, this worked. This worked okay for about four years. Um, except, except to the time when it didn't work, I'll explain. <clears throat> and this is, this is one of my two bottoms. I've got two pretty good bottoms. This is the first one. So I was working a night shift in the control room. And um, I had taken a couple of the sedatives. And I don't know if I took one, one too many, or I don't know if it just hit me just right or what. But on this particular night, I went into a blackout from the get-go. And so it was a 12-hour shift. It was a 12-hour overnight shift. And so when I, when I came to, uh, I was in the control room. The plant manager was there. There was an inspector with from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. A resident inspector was in the in the control room. They were both looking at me, and I had no idea what what I had been doing for the last twelve hours. I had no idea. Right at that moment, my shift turnover came in. So I mean, power plants operate around the clock, so that you don't just go home, close up. You it's shift work. And so my replacement came in, and I remember going to our office. Um, he would take the office, and I would leave. And we had a, um, a log book, and we, he got the log book out, and he looked at it to see what, what I had logged over the 12-hour shift. And it looked like a wild monkey had broken in and did this in the, wild, in, the, in the book. It looked like a wild monkey had gotten in and scribbled in this book, and I had no explanation at all. Maybe, you know, maybe a wild monkey actually did this. I doubt it. But that's the only explanation. I don't know. I don't know what happened. No idea. So I did the only thing I could. I went back to my doctor and I said, uh, I said doctor, I had a, had a reaction to these. And my doctor said, well, I'm going to write you a prescription. Well, I did have a reaction because it took too many. But he said, um, my doctor said, I'm going to write you a prescription to take two weeks off of vacation and look for another job. And the power plant honored it. They actually gave, they had to. They gave them a doctor, doctor written prescription for two weeks vacation. And they gave me two weeks paid vacation 
uh, this was this was about 30 years ago. So I think it's past the statute of limitations. I don't think I can get in any trouble for this. But um, it, during those two weeks, I was able to find a job teaching college physics. And that's that's what I've been doing for the last 30 years. So, you know, it, it, it's like I had a streak of good luck. I had a streak of, I was like the cat that fell nine stories and landed on its feet. And it's like, there were so many things that almost, you know, they almost got me. They almost got me, but they didn't. And um, so I started teaching college physics and um, moved to Myrtle Beach in 1997. I got custody of my children. And, uh, you know, I, I did what a lot of us did. I went to work, taught my classes, came home at four o'clock in the afternoon, had my liquor up in the cabinet somewhere, like above the washer and dryer, and I would drink out of a bottle. And then I'd make my kids dinner, help them with the homework, and then drink some more out of the bottle. And I, I did this, um, I did this for about eight years in this situation. <clears throat> In 2004, this is my last bottom, and this is my recovery. In 2005, my mother and father lived in Clearwater, Florida, and my mother revealed that she had um, four types of cancer. What happened was she had a lump in her breast that she did nothing about. She knew there was a lump. And she just ignored it. And the lump had turned to cancer, was cancer. It had metastasized to her lymph, lymph glands, her lungs, and her bones. And she had lung cancer. She had cancer in four different places. But in her breast, the tumor had broken through the skin <clears throat> and she was taking blood thinner. So when the tumor broke through the skin, she couldn't stop the bleeding. And so she had to tell somebody at that point. And then so she, she was bleeding from a hole in her breast. She had, and they discovered she was riddled with cancer, stage four. And she'd kept this to herself for a couple of years. So um, we did this for about two or three months. You know, we'd go down and see, see my parents. And, um, you know, every time I went, it was just a, it was always just a blackout because I, I would do the wrong things. I would take the wrong things. And then in, in 2005, <clears throat> my sister called me from New Mexico. And out of all the children, I was the one in South Carolina that lived the closest to my mother and father. And so my sister called me and she said, uh, they've admitted her, admitted her mother to the hospital. You need to get down there. She's not going to make it through the night. So first thing I did was I went straight back to my doctor, got a prescription, got it filled, came home, packed up. Kids came home from school. I told the kids we're going to Florida. I took off. It's a 10-hour drive to Florida. So on the way down there, you can't, I mean, I couldn't, you can't really drink and drive for 10, I couldn't, I couldn't drink and drive for 10 hours. So I, I started taking those sedatives and, um, you know, I take three at a time and then another hour would pass and I take another three and another hour would pass, take another three. And then about two o'clock in the morning, um, I decided to add some beer to this. And so I remember I was in this somewhere in Florida, and um, I remember going into a gas station at 2 a.m. and getting two big cans of beer. And I remember going to the bathroom, chugging those two cans of beer really quick, coming back out, and getting a cup of coffee just to take all that and just to sober up, right? Sober up. If you've ever taken sedatives and drank, two big cans of beer on top of them, you know what happens. I had, I had taken about 15 of these sedatives. And then when you add the two cans of beer on top of it, what happened to me was I went into a blackout. Um, and I still had some time to drive. So um, from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., I don't know what happened. 
but at 5 a.m., I woke up and I was driving my car. My car was in the grass. grass my car was moving. And I knew that I was driving in the grass, which didn't make any sense. So as soon as I woke up, it was like my car ran to a telephone pole. And uh, the kids were all buckled, which is a, a blessing. The kids were all buckled up. Um, telephone pole broke in half and everything, there must have been some power lines on it because the power lines hit the ground and there were huge sparks and the sparks were going everywhere. And uh, it was a completely surreal, completely unreal um, scenario. The utility company sent a truck out and they, they were tapping in another uh, telephone pole and a police officer came out. And I remember the police officer was talking to the utility worker and I remember when the police officer saw me. And this was the moment that all the good luck I ever had in my life came to an end. You know, all that stuff about being drunk in graduate school and undergraduate and getting away with this and getting away with that. I knew right at that moment that I couldn't expect to get out of this. So the, the police officer looked right at me and he locked onto my eyes and he, he was focused. I knew I was in trouble. So he, I've, only had to, I've only been arrested one time. And he, he, he came over, he had me do the field sobriety test, and I think I fell asleep. I think, I think he had to wake me up. And so the next thing you know, he's putting handcuffs on, you know, behind my back. And he's put me into the back of a police car. And if you've ever been in the back of a police car, you know, it's like, like this big, because your knees go up to your chin. And <clears throat> forgot to tell you this. <clears throat> when, uh, when we had this car wreck, one of my daughters said that she was hungry. We didn't have any food. And so I said, well, you, you can actually eat grass if you're hungry. And I, so I started eating grass. Um, you had to be there. It, it made sense at the time. So I'm, I'm eating grass to show her. And uh, so when the police officer was giving me this field sobriety test, I had grass in my mouth too. And I'm sure that kind of went against me. Um, so I remember I was in the back of the police, police cruiser and they, they were going through my stuff in the car. And I remember seeing him. He, he, he found a pill bottle. He didn't find the beer cans because I left him back in the bathroom at the gas station. But I remember him looking at the pill bottle, looking at the date. And the date was the day before. And I remember him counting them. And I was thinking, uh-oh. So he, he's counting them. And he's looking. And he figured out. He figured out how many were gone. And so I... I said, they're back in Myrtle Beach. I said, I poured some out and left them in the medicine cabinet in Myrtle Beach with grass in my mouth and smelling like beer. So I just said, now they're back home. And I said, you, you can take my blood. You, you can take my blood. And so when I woke up the next day, I think I passed out. I woke up the next day. I was on a bench. <clears throat> Didn't know where I was. I was surrounded by crazy people. I mean, I was surrounded by crazy people. I couldn't get out. I had a damn Band-Aid on my arm. I had a Band-Aid on my arm. But they had taken me by the hospital, and they had taken my blood. So don't ever tell the police that they can take your blood, because they will take your blood. If you're passed out, they will take your blood. So this was this my bottom. So. Um, it took a couple of days. I was there for a couple of days, made some good friends. Um, my, my sister came and got me. She had flown in from New Mexico. My mother died. Uh, my kids were okay. The police, took, the police took them to the police station, fed them, took good care. I was driving the wrong way on a four-way highway. And when I had the car wreck, I was like, no one knew where I was, way lost in Florida somewhere, northern Florida. Um, came home it, it it's like I never missed a beat it was like didn't affect me at all I lost my car I was terribly humiliated terribly my, my kids were 10 10 and 14 at the time um I lost my mother uh I mean it was probably another blessing in disguise that 
I did not make it because if I had made it to the hospital in that situation, it would not have been any better with me there. So I came back to Myrtle Beach and it, it wasn't long before I was doing the same thing again. And so here's the thing. <clears throat> this was in 2005 and I had a um, eight o'clock astronomy class that I was teaching. And if you've ever done anything as an alcoholic at eight o'clock, you, you still smell. I mean, I did. I still smell at eight o'clock. I've taught many a class at eight o'clock in the morning in the blackout, but not because I was drinking before I went in, but because of the night before. Um, but this particular semester, I had two students. I had one student that brought me AA literature to their astronomy professor, which had nothing to do with astronomy. So he must have been just crazy. The student brought me AA literature in astronomy. So how nuts is this? And put his name and phone number on the AA literature. So I took it and I kept it. And I just thought, you're not, you're not job. And then a second student in the same class, a different demographic, this student did not look like the first one. But she came up and she brought me AA literature. So I came back to Myrtle Beach and I, uh, this was in the summer, the spring semester had ended, but I still had that AA literature. So what happened to me was I was 12th step by a couple of students. They passed the message on to me. They planted a seed and when it was right, it grew. So I got that AA literature out, and I, the number of students' name was on there. It was a male student, so I called him up. <clears throat> I said, Mike, this is what happened. He said, are you ready to go to a meeting? And I said, yeah. He told me, told me where to go. So <clears throat> so I went to this meeting. It was a 5.30 speaker meeting, and it was a, a biker chick. And as a college professor, I related completely to this biker chick. She told her story, and I understood exactly what she was saying. So, um, so anyway... Meetings were good for me in the beginning. Um, the first 30 days, all I did was meetings. Uh, the speaker meetings were great. I enjoyed going to meetings, and they worked for me. But after 30 days, I thought I knew better. And after 30 days, something came up, and I relapsed. After 30 days, I had a weekend where I was completely blacked out. And at the end of that blackout, I came back into the rooms, and I said, uh, told somebody what happened. And he said, well, who's your sponsor? And I said, well, I don't really need a sponsor. <laughs> I don't really need a sponsor. It's me. I don't, I mean, I was going to meetings every day. I don't, I really don't need a sponsor. He said, that's why you relapsed. He said, the reason why you relapsed is because you didn't have a sponsor. And, and the guy said, just pay attention. He said, just listen to what the other people say. And just listen. And when someone says something that makes sense to you and you respect them, respect what they say, Ask him to be your sponsor. And, and so I did. I did just that. And um, again, the demographic completely different, but uh, he had some experiences that I had. And it's like, yeah, I think he'll understand me. And, and it worked. You know, I became 99% willing to take suggestions. You know, he, he, he suggested I chair meetings, I answer the phone service. He made suggestions about reading the steps, things I didn't want to do. You know, I wanted to just go, I just wanted to go to a meeting and just don't say anything. And my sponsor said, no, you've got to participate. So this was great. And it, it worked really solid for about two and a half years. And I'll tell you what happened the two and a half years. Um, the person who committed the sexual abuse against me was a family member. And for the last 
for the previous the prior 35 years i pretended like it nothing you know I, I pretended like it just didn't happen and i was two and a half years sober and i was teaching an eight o'clock class and the person called me about our father and left a message and it was something in the tone of his voice that triggered me and when i say triggered i started shaking and i know it's happened to other people because other people have told me it's happened to them i started shaking i started sh it's like i was shaking in my bones and um right then with two and a half years sober chairing meetings sponsoring man, answering the phone service, going to one to two meetings a day, sometimes three meetings a day, uh, I was going to pick up a drink. And so I knew right then and there, and this was like a split second, I was going to do one of two things and I had to make a decision right now. It was 10 o'clock in the morning, my class was over, I was shaking. I was either going to go to the liquor store, get a pint, do what I used to do, what I used to do, or I was going to deal with this. And I had to decide right now. And so without thinking, I picked up my phone and I called that person back. And I just said, you need to know that I remember what you did. And you've got seven days to turn yourself into the place where I'm going to do it for you. And I left a message. I called back about an hour later and he had disconnected his phone. So seven days later, called the police and an investigator was assigned. A case was opened. Case worker uh, took about two years. Uh, it was two years of sexual abuse counseling on my part over and over and over. I had to go through different counselors. And, I mean, the detective. The detective could find many other family members. This abuser was a high school principal in West Virginia, and he got bounced around to different schools. And all he had to do was just go back to the other schools, and he could find family members who had stories about their kids, or he had taken them on trips, and then he, he raped them. He was raping them. And but then they, they couldn't find the, the victim. They'd say, oh, yeah, he's in Seattle. He's like alcoholic and he's homeless in Seattle. Or they'd say, yeah, he's like down in Houston, but he's like a really bad drug addict. And that's what, that's what was happening. It's like this abuse was causing this drug addiction and alcoholism. I was the only one they could find. You can't prosecute them. You can't prosecute someone based on the family. It has to be the actual victim themselves. So after about two years, they had to drop the case. And, uh, but the thing is, I stayed sober. I stayed sober. Um, I was very open about it. And my case, the information about my case was available on the internet. There's my picture and my phone number. Everything was up there. I didn't care. You know, it's just, I went, it was my truth. This was my truth. But I only had to go through it once. Uh, it was not pleasant. I said, it took about two years. But if I had not done this, I probably would have drank. This is what I've learned. I don't think anybody relapses because it's a good premeditated decision. And you think it might be best to live out your golden years drinking liquor from a bottle like I did. No, I think we relapse because you can't stand the way you feel. And that's, that's the way I felt. Yeah, it was not pleasant to be shaking in my bones. And I knew if I drank half a pint of liquor, that would fix it right then and there would fix it. So from 2000, 2008 to 2000 and, and now really um, it's been solid meetings. Um, there's been some things that have happened to me that I'd like to go to tell you before I close in, in 2010, um, 2010, I went to my first sober concert. It was an Everclear concert here in Myrtle Beach. And I remember it was a big deal for me. I've, I've actually gone deaf in one ear as, as a result of concerts, um, but not in 2010. So I, I went to this one concert. I made a big deal. I took like $10. I didn't take my license. 
and I just went in and I, you know, I didn't have enough money for a drink. I had enough money for a Coke and I went and I, it was great. I pulled it off. In 2019, I introduced the lead singer from Everclear. I brought him to my college to speak about his own recovery. I and mean, I went to dinner with him. This actual lead singer from this concert, I mean, I spent a weekend with him. He's in recovery too. 2019, I was named professor of the year at my college. I was named community advocate of the year for the, I do some work at the college in recovery. I bring in celebrity speakers. Trejo was come. Danny Trejo is not an AA event, so I can say names. Danny Trejo has come. I spent time with Danny Trejo. I'm in one of his movies. I have to put a couple of clips in one of his movies. Lou Gossett has come. I was given those, uh, given that award in 2019 from my work there. I got married in 2019 to a, a normal person who's never seen me drink or drug. Um, the graduate school, graduate school that I went to, Virginia, won the national championship in 2019. We have banner years, at least I did. In 2019, it was the best year of my life. It was the best year of my life. If I was drinking, did I have these when I was drinking and drugging? I don't know. You know, it was like I had a few good days, but they were all bad years when I was drinking. And now I have a few bad moments, but I have all good years, every single one of them. So I'll close with this. Um, you, you know, I, I got through a moment where a two year moment where it was not pleasant, but I dealt with something that was a symptom um, from my alcoholism. Uh, it, it was connected to my alcoholism, but I dealt with it. Um, could I have stayed sober if I didn't do this? I really don't think I could have. I really don't think I could have. Will something, something like this happen again? Well, will something else generate that anxiety where I'm shaking? I hope not, but I can't count on it. I didn't think that it wouldn't happen in 2008. Or whenever it was, 2008 for me, and it caught me by surprise. So the, the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, if you're going to meetings, keep going to meetings. If you have a sponsor, keep a sponsor. Use your sponsor. If you're sponsoring men and women or women, keep doing it. We have to keep our pencils sharpened. I really think that I need to keep my pencil sharpened to be ready for the next time something happens. Uh, you know, it Will I get through it the next time? I hope so. Because if I had picked up that bottle of liquor in 2008, I wouldn't be here today. That's all I got. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 